Hi everybody. In this video, we'll start to look at the macroscopic laws of thermodynamics, particularly as they relate to gases. And we'll start with an introduction to pressure volume work and the first law of thermodynamics. In the past several videos, we've developed a small particle view of ideal gases from the viewpoint of statistical mechanics. Now we're going to think about how macroscopic systems behave when energy is added or removed in various forms, specifically as work and heat. Imagine we have a macroscopic sample of a gas in a sealed container with a piston on top. The gas has some initial pressure, volume, and temperature. And then to that sample, we apply some external force, F external. That force may be atmospheric pressure, or it may be a weight that you put on the piston. And then we end up with a smaller volume of gas. The piston has gone down, and we now have some final volume that's less than the initial volume. The first question I have for you by way of introduction is, is the work done on the gas, which we'll represent with the letter W, positive or negative? This is largely a sign convention, but I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Again, this is mainly a sign convention and not really something you could have figured out. But in chemistry, our convention is that when a gas is compressed, we call the amount of work done positive. In other words, work is being done on the gas. Energy is being transferred to the gas when it's compressed. So from the viewpoint of the gas, we call the amount of work positive. It's important to point out that you might actually see the opposite sign convention in a physics or an engineering course, where work is thought about in terms of the amount of work that the system does on the surroundings, thinking about it as a sort of machine. But from our chemist's viewpoint, Compression means positive work because energy is being transferred to the gas through work. Next, let's figure out how much work is actually done when this gas is compressed. As you may remember from a physics course, work is generally force times distance. So in this case, the work that's done on the piston is the external force times the distance that it travels. So that's going to be F external times the change in height of the piston. If that's the amount of work that's done on the piston, then the amount of work that's done on the gas, which is the W that we care about, is going to be the opposite of that, negative force external times the change in height of the piston. Then we can recall that pressure is a force per unit area, so we can express force external as a pressure external times A, which is going to be the cross-sectional area of the piston. Again, this external pressure could be the atmospheric pressure or some external pressure applied by a weight on the piston. Finally, we can group these last terms, A times delta H, into a delta V, a change in volume of the piston. So although we've looked at a specific case here with a cylindrical piston, this last expression here, that the work done on the gas is negative P external times delta V, that is general. So this last equation that we developed here, W equals minus P external times delta V, this is true if the external pressure is constant. If that P external stays the same the whole time, then this is the amount of work that's done. But it may be the case that the external pressure is changing. Maybe it starts smaller at the beginning of the compression and then gets larger as you get further into the compression. And if that's the case, if P external changes, then we can think about this process as happening in very small steps. So rather than having a large delta V, we can express this as an integral. If the external pressure is changing, then W equals minus integral from initial volume to final volume of P external, which could be changing throughout the process, times dV. These two equations are basically the same, but the second one allows for changes in the external pressure. Just as a sanity check with our sign convention, notice that if the gas is compressed, that means delta V is negative. In other words, volume is getting smaller. So we have a negative sign out front multiplied by a negative sign in delta V, which means that the amount of work done in compression is positive, which we said is our sign convention. We're often going to be representing the conditions of a gas sample and figuring out the amount of work done on it using a pressure volume diagram like this, where volume is on the horizontal axis and pressure is on the vertical axis. Suppose we have an ideal gas sample that has some initial pressure, volume, and temperature, 
and we allow that gas to expand to a larger volume, such that the pressure gets lower. In order to figure out how much work is done on this gas, we need to think about what path it takes from the initial conditions to the final conditions. First, suppose that for the entire time that this gas expands, the external pressure is equal to the final pressure. In other words, if we think of this gas as being in a piston, we can say that the external pressure on the piston suddenly lowers to the final pressure, and the entire expansion takes place at that final pressure. The first question I have is graphically, in terms of pictures, what is the amount of work that's done on the gas? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. If the external pressure is equal to the final pressure for the whole time, then we can represent the external pressure on this PV diagram as a horizontal line at the final pressure. We already said that W, the amount of pressure volume worked on on the gas, is equal to the negative integral of the external pressure times dV. We know from calculus that we can represent an integral visually as the area under a curve. So in this case, we can represent the amount of work done by the area of the rectangle under this horizontal line. And according to our sign convention, because the ideal gas is expanding in this case, it would actually be the negative area of the rectangle under that line. Alternatively, let's think about a situation where this ideal gas expands bit by bit, where the external pressure at all points during the expansion is equal to the pressure of the gas itself. I'd like you to think for a few seconds about how W, the amount of work done on the gas, compares in this case to the previous case. In this case, because we're lowering the pressure bit by bit and allowing the pressure of the gas to catch up to the external pressure, the graph of the external pressure on this PV diagram is going to follow Boyle's law, the inverse relationship between pressure and volume, so it's going to look like this. Again, because pressure volume work is defined as the negative integral of the external pressure times dV, work is again going to be the negative area under this curve, and if you look at the shape of this curve compared to the previous one, that means the work in this case is going to be more negative than it was in the previous case. Now that we've defined pressure volume work, I want to think about kind of a big picture question of where is the energy during a process like the expansion of an ideal gas? As we saw in our coverage of statistical mechanics and kinetic molecular theory, the total energy of an ideal gas depends only on the temperature. So that means that if the temperature stays the same, the total energy of a gas isn't going to change either. But we just saw that when a gas expands, it does work on the surroundings, and therefore W is negative, and the gas loses energy to the surroundings through work. But we know from our physics courses that it's generally true that energy is conserved. So how would it even be possible for a gas to have an isothermal expansion? In other words, how would it be possible for a gas to expand and therefore have energy transferred away from it as work, but still hold its same temperature in an isothermal process? How is it possible that that gas didn't lose any energy when it expanded? I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. That question was, if not a trick question, then at least a question that requires a concept that we hadn't talked about yet. In order for a gas to do work on its surroundings but not lose any of its total energy, we can conclude that there must be another type of energy transfer to the gas that's compensating for the work that's done. This other type of energy transfer is heat, which we're going to represent with the letter Q. Heat can be defined as the spontaneous transfer of energy from a hotter object to a colder object. I'd like to point out here that it may seem kind of strange to us that it's possible that there could be heat transfer in an isothermal process, heat transfer where there's no change in temperature. The way that we typically use the word heat in the English language, we often equate heating something up with increasing its temperature, but that's not actually how it's defined here. In this case, when we have the isothermal expansion of an ideal gas, heat is actually being transferred to the gas in order to keep it from getting colder. So energy is being transferred, but that energy isn't necessarily making the system a higher temperature. Now that we've defined work and heat, 
we're in a position to state maybe the most important equation we're going to see in this course, which is the first law of thermodynamics. It's essentially just a statement of the conservation of energy, delta U equals Q plus W. U is what's called the internal energy of a system, and it's basically just the total energy of the system adding up the kinetic and potential energy. So this equation is telling us that delta U, the change in the internal energy of a system, is equal to Q, the heat that's transferred to the system, and W, the work that's done on the system. Again, this is really just a statement of conservation of energy. It's telling us that the change in the total energy of a system is just the sum of the types of energy that are transferred to it and from it. In this case, a sum of the heat that's transferred to the system and the work that's done on the system. I mentioned earlier that in a physics or engineering course, you may see the opposite sign convention for work. As a result, you may in one of those courses see the first law of thermodynamics stated as delta U equals Q minus W. That's what's going on. It's just the opposite sign convention for work. But in this course, and in chemistry in general, you're going to see the first law stated like this, delta U equals Q plus W. Now that we've seen the first law of thermodynamics, I'd like to revisit our example of the isothermal expansion of an ideal gas, putting some numbers to it and thinking about the values of delta U, Q, and W. Before looking at numbers, I'd like to think qualitatively about what we think the signs are of delta U, Q, and W for the isothermal expansion of an ideal gas. In other words, do we think each of those are positive, negative, or zero? I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. Well, let's go one by one. If it's an isothermal process, meaning the temperature stays constant, and we know that for an ideal gas, U, the internal energy of the system, depends only on temperature, then for an isothermal process, delta U must always be zero. There's never a change in internal energy if the temperature doesn't change. The other thing that we've already seen is that for any expansion of a gas, W is going to be negative. That's our sign convention. So that means we can figure out Q from the first law of thermodynamics. If delta U equals Q plus W, and we already know that delta U is zero and W is negative, then that means Q has to be positive. So that's what we expect the signs to be. Let's see if we can find their values in this case. We'll do a bit of a derivation here, so I'll make the figure smaller to give us more room for equations. Again, the easy one to figure out is delta U. It's an isothermal process, and because the temperature isn't changing, the internal energy is also not changing. Delta U equals zero. The other quantity that we've learned how to find is W. W is going to be the area under the curve, the negative integral from initial volume to final volume of the external pressure times dV. Since we're doing this expansion slowly, allowing the pressure of the gas to catch up to the pressure of the surroundings, we can express this slightly differently as the negative integral of P, the pressure of the gas, times dV. We can use the ideal gas law to replace pressure with nRT over V. Because nR and T are all constant, that's the number of moles, the gas constant, and the temperature in an isothermal process are all constant, we can take them out of the integral. So we're left with just an integral of dV over V. And the integral of 1 over V is going to be a natural log of V. So the value of that integral is ln V2 minus ln V1. Hopefully you remember from your log rules that we can express that as the natural log of a quotient, V2 over V1. And now we have the symbolic expression for work. And if we want, we can plug in the values for this particular example the number of moles, the gas constant, the temperature, and the ratio of volumes. The volume is expanding by a factor of 5, so that's a natural log of 5. And if we plug all of those numbers in, we can get a value for W, negative 39.9 kilojoules. So this is how the process typically goes when we're finding quantities in the first law of thermodynamics. We can usually solve for two of them. In this case, we solve for delta U and W, and we can find the third one from the first law of thermodynamics. We know that delta U has to be equal to Q plus W. We already found delta U and W, so we can easily find Q, the heat that's transferred, which in this case is going to be the opposite of the work, positive 39.9 kilojoules. So there we go. 
This slide summarizes the values that we just found for delta U, W, and Q for an isothermal process. And while I wouldn't necessarily suggest that you memorize them, these values are general for any isothermal expansion or compression of an ideal gas. There's kind of a subtle distinction that I'd like to briefly mention now, and that's the distinction between reversible and irreversible processes. As you can imagine, a gas in a piston can be compressed and it can also expand. In order for a gas to be compressed, the external pressure has to be greater than or equal to the pressure of a gas. That's what forces the gas to compress. In order for a gas to expand, the external pressure has to be less than or equal to the pressure of a gas. That's what allows the gas to expand. So in order for both of these steps to take place under the same conditions, in other words, in order for the process to be reversible, the external pressure would have to be equal to the pressure at all times. This relates to the language that we were using before of allowing the pressure of the system to catch up to the pressure of the surroundings. At all times, system and surroundings have the same pressure. Another way of defining a reversible process is that it's one in which the system and surroundings are in thermal equilibrium the whole time. The system and surroundings have the same temperature. This distinction between reversible and irreversible processes will come up a number of times later in the course, and as we'll see when we talk about entropy, there are some important consequences of it. But for the time being, I just want you to be aware that this distinction exists, and that it's often important for a process to be reversible in order for us to figure out things about it. So most of the time in this course, we're going to be thinking about reversible processes just because they're more well-defined and easier for us to think about. Some examples of reversible processes would be the very slow compression or expansion of a gas or the very slow heating of a system on a hot plate. Notice these keywords very slow. This idea that the system has time to catch up to the surroundings is the requirement for a process to be reversible. Some examples of irreversible processes would be the rapid cooling of a system with liquid nitrogen. So that would be where temperature changes happen quickly. And also the thermal equilibration of a hot metal in cold water. So in that case, when you have something hot and something cold in thermal contact, we know by this definition at the top of the slide that that must be irreversible. When we solve problems involving pressure volume diagrams in this course, we're typically going to be working under well-defined conditions. In the first example, we looked at an ideal gas under isothermal conditions, meaning there was no change in temperature and therefore no change in internal energy. The other example we're going to work through involves an ideal gas under conditions in which no heat is transferred, so Q equals zero. These conditions have a name that you may have heard. They're called adiabatic conditions. In practice, we can assume that a system is under adiabatic conditions if the heat transfer to and from the system is very slow. For example, if it happens in a well-insulated container, like a thermos or a doer. So the example we're going to look at now involves a monatomic ideal gas expanding reversibly and adiabatically. Before we go through the math, I'll ask the qualitative question of do you think this ideal gas, as it expands reversibly and adiabatically, is going to have its temperature increase or decrease? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Consider each of the quantities in the first law of thermodynamics. If the conditions are adiabatic, then that means by definition Q equals zero. There's no heat transfer. By our sign convention, any gas that expands is going to have a negative W. So if we think about the first law, delta U equals Q plus W. So delta U equals zero plus a negative number. So delta U is negative, meaning the internal energy of the gas is going to go down. Because the internal energy of a gas is proportional to its temperature, if the internal energy decreases, the temperature is also going to decrease. If we think about this qualitatively, what we're basically saying is that if the gas expands and therefore loses energy through work, and there isn't any compensating transfer of heat, then the gas is going to lose energy and its temperature will get lower. This pressure volume diagram shows both an isothermal path and an adiabatic path. 
we know that the isothermal path, where the temperature doesn't change, has a Boyle's Law relationship between pressure and volume. They're inversely proportional. The shape of the adiabatic path looks kind of similar, but isn't exactly the same. You can see that if an isothermal expansion and an adiabatic expansion start at the same conditions on the left side of this pressure volume diagram, and the two paths expand to the same volume, then the adiabatic path is going to end up at a lower pressure, and therefore a lower temperature, as we said on the previous slide. So let's figure out by how much the temperature decreases in an adiabatic expansion of an ideal gas. Specifically, the question that we're going to answer is for the reversible adiabatic expansion of a monatomic ideal gas. From initial volume and temperature V1 and T1 to final volume and temperature V2 and T2, what is that final temperature T2? This is going to be kind of a tricky derivation, but an important one. I'll make the figure smaller so we have room for some math. Because we're looking at adiabatic conditions, we know that Q equals zero, not only for the path as a whole, but for every small step of the path. The first law of thermodynamics tells us that if there's no heat transfer, then the change in internal energy is equal to the work. That's true both for the full path and for every infinitesimally small step of it. So for every small step of this path, du, the differential change in internal energy, is going to be equal to dw, the differential amount of work. We can make substitutions for both of those quantities. You may remember that Cv, the constant volume heat capacity, is defined as the derivative of internal energy with respect to temperature. Cv equals du over dt. If we swing around the dt, then we can say that du is equal to Cv times dt. So we'll make that substitution. And we can also make a substitution for dw. We know that work is defined as the negative integral of PdV. So the differential amount of work is going to be the stuff inside the integral, negative P dV. So we've substituted quantities for both du and dW. And in the next step, we can make further substitutions based on the specific conditions in this problem. We're looking at a monatomic ideal gas, and we know from our coverage of statistical mechanics what the constant volume heat capacity of a monatomic ideal gas is. It's 3 halves nr, because a monatomic ideal gas only has a translational component, and we don't have to worry about rotation or vibration. So we can substitute 3 halves nr in place of Cv. And then from the ideal gas law, we can replace the pressure with nrt over V. So we've made those substitutions. You can see that we have nrs that cancel on both sides of the equation. And we can swing around the temperature term to put all of the temperature terms on the left side of the equation and all of the volume terms on the right. We can take the integral of both sides from the initial conditions to the final conditions. And we know that the integral of 1 over t or of 1 over v are the respective natural logs. If we think about our log rules, we can move that 3 halves that's out front into an exponent inside the natural log, like this. And while this equation looks pretty difficult, if the natural logs of two things are equal to each other, then the two things themselves must also be equal to each other. So we're getting pretty close to an answer. Remember, we're trying to solve for t2. So we're going to take both sides of this equation and raise them to the 2 thirds power, and then we can swing around t1 and end up with an expression for t2 in terms of t1 and the two volumes. t2 equals t1 times the ratio of the volumes to the 2 thirds. Remember, we expected the temperature to go down in the adiabatic expansion of an ideal gas. When the gas expands, we know that V2 is going to be larger than V1, and therefore T2 equals T1 times a number that's less than 1. So it is true that T2 ends up being less than T1, as we expected. I suggest taking some time to make sure you followed all the steps of this derivation, because it's a pretty important style of derivation. While this example was specific to a monatomic ideal gas, you could imagine how, if you were given a problem involving, say, a diatomic ideal gas, you could adapt this approach, changing the heat capacity, to solve it. Finally, I'd just like to leave you with a few takeaway messages. In this video, we use pressure volume diagrams to keep track of energy transfer to and from a system. The two examples we looked at involved isothermal and adiabatic conditions.
And it's true that it's easiest for us to solve numerical problems when we're dealing with things like ideal gases, reversible processes, and conditions where we can set something to zero. In isothermal conditions, we can set delta U to zero. In adiabatic conditions, we can set Q to zero. And we didn't really talk about it, but in constant volume conditions, we can set W to zero. The final thing that I'll say is that problems like the ones we worked in this video really are tricky and take some practice. So I encourage you to really take some time to think about these and work similar problems for yourself. That's all for now. In the next video, we'll talk about more of the consequences and nuances of the first law of thermodynamics.